CEOs are telling us that the amount of resources that the company allocates to uh, leveraging Chinese innovations, that is to say innovations developed in, in this market, is not sufficient. You are listening to C-Suite Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to C-Suite Perspectives, a signature series by the Conference Board. I'm Steve Odlin from the Conference Board and the host of this series. And in today's conversation, we're going to discuss the level of CEO confidence in China. Joining me today is Alfredo Montefarhelu, the head of the China Center at the Conference Board. Direct from Beijing, welcome, Alfredo. Thank you, Steve. It's great to join you again. So the CEO Confidence Index is, is brand new. It's just, uh, it's just been conducted. Uh, tell us a little bit about the index. You know, how do you do it? Who participates and so forth? Absolutely, Steve. So this index is something that we create based on a confidence survey to the CEOs of some of the largest multinationals that are operating in China. All of them are members of the China Center of the conference board. Um, so based on questions about current, future business conditions, and also business conditions on their own sectors, we build an index from zero to 100. Any measure that is below 50 uh, suggests that on average, their uh, sentiment about business conditions is uh, negative. Readings above 50 suggest that on average, CEOs are, are more optimistic about business conditions. So uh, the latest measure of CEO confidence was conducted on April, so very recent. And what we saw in terms of the reading actually is uh, cautious optimism uh, from the part of CEOs because the index just went up slightly from 54 six months ago to 56, so barely above the 50 mark. Yeah, so the 50 is sort of the demarcation line, and so going from 54 to 56. So they're slightly positive um, and cautiously optimistic about the, the state of business in China. What do you think is driving this slight move upward? Well, Steve, there is no question that these are extraordinary times for multinationals in China. Uh, the combined effect of market, economic, regulatory, and geopolitical factors are leading to the emergence of what I call a new competitive reality. And this is putting business resilience to the test like never before. It's challenging all notions about the China opportunity, notions that were generated over the previous decades of high rapid growth. And it's also forcing a rethinking of China's role uh, as a key link in global supply chains. So MNCs are understandably taking a cautious approach towards their investments and operations in China. Now, the slight increase from 54 to 56 it must be said, it wasn't really driven by increased optimism about the outlook. It was driven by a decrease in pessimism about the outlook. Actually, a large part of the CEOs think that business conditions now and uh, six months from now will remain the same. So it's, 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 more, it's more a stabilization of, what, of their sentiment and it's important because the reason why we saw, for example, in 2020 and in 2021 and 2022, a decrease in optimism was because of the impact of COVID. Now, once China emerged from zero COVID in 2022, in the, at the end of 2022, there was this feeling of optimism that China would actually grow back to where it was. And these expectations were not fulfilled. So it really hurt sentiment. But now what we are seeing is that optimism is once again rebalancing, let's say. Yeah, and these MNCs are sort of multinational corporations. So they're headquartered, Alfredo, mostly in Western Europe and North America, right? Absolutely. Some of them, however, are also headquartered in Hong Kong and uh, some other Asian countries. I got it. Okay. And so these are, these are large multinational corporations headquartered outside of China for the most part, and then having business in China. And so these are, it, it, it's difficult for these CEOs who are, who are not Chinese natives, they're not state-owned companies to navigate this environment because there are so many shifting sands in China. Absolutely, Steve. One of the main challenges that China-based CEOs of these multinationals face, as I said, 
is that they are facing a new competitive reality. And again, you got to think about the previous three decades of growth in China, where profit was here, it grew very uh, a double digit. And so the current market conditions are challenging those uh, perceptions of what the China opportunity used to be. Uh, these are perceptions at the head office level, so in headquarters. So when you're a CEO here in China, you have to not only respond to the market uh, changes, but you also have to convince your head office that continuing to invest in China has uh, a benefit, uh, that defending market share requires investments, and that they just need to continue uh, betting on the market because this market continues giving opportunities. It's just that whilst before capturing the opportunity was easier, right now it requires a lot of recalibration of the strategies. Yeah, and you know the market in China is a little different than markets elsewhere. It's not completely a free market, you know, um, you know, governed by the invisible hand. It, it's a, it's essentially a state directed economy. So it's you know um, it's a little different. And so there, if you're operating in China for China, which these CEOs are, you're really you know open to whatever happens to demand and that demand is influenced by a lot of factors talk about that absolutely steve so one of the characteristics of the chinese market is that when you compare it to western markets as you say western markets they have the invisible hand it's about uh, the economic fundamentals it's about the opportunities derived from market competition here in china it's more about policies and regulations so regulatory hospitality in China is extremely important, not only for foreign companies, but also for Chinese companies, even for state-owned companies. So for the MNCs, uh, many of the opportunities that they have captured over the past decades is because the sectors where they operate actually received uh, preferential policies from the government because the government wanted to develop them. Uh, the Chinese government always looks at the sectors and the areas where they face a development gap. And they, all, they, they always think about those sectors which are strategic from their perspective, which are a priority. And in those sectors, as we know, for example, right now in terms of technology, they um, come up with policies, come up with regulations, uh, with uh, financial support in order for them, uh, for these sectors to leapfrog. Right. So in many ways, uh, this is what's driving the opportunity in China and what will what will continue driving uh, the opportunity for uh, Chinese and foreign companies uh, on, on the on the positive side. Uh, and this is not related to the measure of your confidence. Last year, we we had conducted some polls which we conducted prior to our China CEO councils, which these are, these are uh, the, our two flagship events where we talk only with CEOs of these companies. And they told us that the receptiveness of authorities has improved, that the, the friendliness of authorities and the, the way they try to help uh, foreign companies is improving, which is not surprising because China right now is facing a very challenging economic situation. And of course, foreign direct investment, continued business opportunities, employment, that's important for them. And so that's, it's, it's, it's really not uh, surprising that they are trying to you know, capture more of that uh, capital investment uh, for their economic growth. So what do the uh, CEOs tell us about their sales, investment, and employment expectations? Right. So the latest confidence survey, uh, they tell us that sales, uh, the outlook is actually improving. But again, a large proportion of them tell us that it remains the same. But, it, but it's, it's better than six months ago. In terms of capital investments, the majority tell us that the level of capital investment will remain the same, which is positive because under the current conditions, there is a thinking that investment would decrease, but actually just the minority tell us that it will decrease. The, the only negative thing is employment. Actually, only 6% told us that they expect to increase headcount. It's a very tiny percentage. And a large part of them told us that they will continue reducing headcount to reduce costs. Yeah, and that that's a big deal in China. They have a lot of people, and they need that the uh, employment in order to to keep things going. So, what what do the CEOs tell us about their top risks? What are they worried about? The top risk that they're worried about has to do with the economic weakness, uh, because 
with a growth weakness, what comes is a change in consumption behavior. And what we're seeing right now in the market is that consumption is what, as, as we call it, downgrading. So people are buying similar products as before, but less expensive. In addition to this, demand is softening. So this is, all, this is already hitting the profits of companies. Another risk is overcapacity. And overcapacity not only because it spills over into geopolitics, but also because it adds to depressionary pressures on the economy and, of course, pushes prices down. Um, another risk, very important, is the intensity of local competition. Because Chinese companies in China are fighting for survival. This is their only market. Now, foreign MNCs, this is one market in a global strategy. For these Chinese companies, they're fighting tooth and nail for every bit of market share they can take. And this is because, as I said before, consumers are downgrading. So what this means is that Chinese companies are competing by lowering prices, which means then that competition in China is being shifted to a lower price point, and this is hurting profits. Now, another big risk for, uh, for MNCs is, of course, geopolitical tensions, because uh, geopolitical tensions always, now that they have been increasing over the past months, uh, for example, uh, we saw that uh, the European uh, Commission has uh, imposed temporary tariffs on NEVs, and China already retaliated by, announce, by announcing an anti-subsidy investigation on pork imports from the European Union. So the more geopolitical tensions they are, it increases uncertainty. And when there is uncertainty in the market, CEOs find it very hard to plan ahead on how to respond to both negative and positive conditions. And also because it increases the risk for companies to be caught in the crossfire of tit-for-tat uh, policy and regulatory measures. Yeah. Now, it, you know, we have talked about the real estate market um, in our past podcasts, Alfredo, but clearly the real estate is a huge portion of the Chinese economy. Talk about the effect and the current status of the real estate market on the CEO's outlook. Absolutely. Uh, well, what's happening to the real estate market has really left a hole in aggregate demand in China. It was estimated that uh, real estate by itself, uh, and you know, because of all the demand it generated for industrial activity, it contributed up to 30% of GDP growth. Households also had an estimated 70% of their wealth in household assets. And local governments used to get upwards of 30% of revenue from land sales to developers. So real estate is just that big contributor of growth. And of course, the situation is not like that anymore. So this is one of the main reasons why confidence continues being negative in China. And this is, of course, driving demand down. And the situation continues being the same. Real estate is still in a downturn. Uh, the Chinese government has been coming up with several measures to try to support a recovery or a rebalancing of the market. So the central government has come up with a refinancing uh, program worth 300 billion RMB, and it's focused on um, helping lo local governments buy housing stock to then change it into affordable housing. And so what this does is that they are leveraging up to diminish housing inventory. Now, 300 billion RMB is not nearly enough to buy the trillions of RMB that are in housing stock in China, but it is a signal that the government might be willing to increase more of their debt in order to reduce housing inventories. If that happens, the real estate sector might actually bottom out of its current downturn. And this could uh, be a watershed moment for, for the economy. Yes. We're talking about CEO confidence in China. We're going to take a short break and be right back. What does the future of work mean for your employees? How will your company navigate ESG? Will there be a global recession? At the Conference Board, our experts translate the latest research and economic analysis into insights and real-time problem solving for your organization. Membership at the Conference Board provides your team with an assortment of knowledge from economics, marketing and communications, ESG, public policy, and human capital. As a member, you'll have access to our center experts, member-exclusive events, data and benchmarking tools, and peer sharing that will help you understand the present 
and shape the future. Consider becoming a Conference Board member today by visiting www.conference-board.org. Welcome back to C-Suite Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin from the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by Alfredo Montefarhelo, the head of our China Center at the Conference Board. Okay, so um, Alfredo, before the break, we were talking about the real estate sector and the, you know, the impact of that, and that the Chinese government actually views this as um, you know, a big risk on their own, and they're investing back. But this is a pattern or a process that the Chinese government goes through. They, they, they prioritize certain industries, certain sectors, and they weigh in. So you, it's not a, a market-driven economy. It's a market and state-driven economy. It's a little bit of both. And that's, uh, you know, it's a little hard to navigate, but they do try to level things out. How do the CEOs view that environment? Well, it, it is, as I said, an environment where regulations and policies drive opportunities. And of course, uh, the announcements and the policies that the government uh, implements in the economy are in a way a signal of, of, of where business is going. So under the current circumstances, what we are waiting right now is more of a signal from the government with respect to what they will do in order to yeah, alleviate the real estate uh, situation and also to uh, try to unlock the potential of development. Because what we have seen so far is that the government is stimulating the economy on the supply side. So a lot of investment is going into manufacturing in order to offset the drop in property investment. And this, as we know, is leading to overcapacity, overcapacity that is generating geopolitical tensions because of the probability of this overcapacity being exported and hollowing out strategic industries in Europe and the US. So that's a big problem. And the Chinese government understands that. Uh, but of course, this is this, this only, um, in, on top of only you know, exacerbating geopolitical tensions, it doesn't really solve the problem of ultimately what, what, what the government needs in order for the economy to grow sustainably is to increase confidence, is to increase demand. And so we're expecting some measures uh, at the third plenum of the Chinese uh, Communist Party, which is going to be held in July. So it, as they look at, as the CEOs look at the, at the various sectors, which ones um, do they think are most attractive right now and, and which ones do they think are least attractive? That's a very interesting question because, of course, despite some sectors being challenged by the current conditions, CEOs actually remain positive about their ability to respond to the challenges, right? So they are actually uh, recalibrating there are strategies. We just had last week a CEO council session, Steve, and the takeaway of that uh, from companies that are, uh, you know, operating in consumer facing sectors and companies that are operating more on the supply side is that despite the challenges, they will take measures to adapt, right? Of course, alignment with headquarters is very important. Maintaining the competitiveness of their products and services is important. Incorporating Chinese innovations is important but they are trying to respond and they have confidence in their ability to continue succeeding. Now, having said that, um, and as, as we have been uh, talking about today, policy and regulations are important. And the government has already determined that uh, some strategic sectors are, for example, anything related to biotech, healthcare, uh, NEVs, uh, batteries. So all of those strategic sectors uh, themselves present various opportunities for CEOs. So if you look at the healthcare sector and at the biotech sector, companies there are actually you know, receiving a lot of opportunities in the market and also from uh, regulations and policies. Yeah. So consumer, healthcare, um, some manufacturing, particularly in energy um, and, and so forth. How about heavy manufacturing uh, or manufacturing for for export? Are, are CEOs um, of MNCs focused on that, or is that largely driven by home-based companies? Well, I mean, it's a combination. Some 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 uh, MNCs are also manufacturing to export to other markets, uh, and but the majority, of course, are Chinese SMEs that are exporting to other markets. We've seen exports uh, increase over the past months uh, from China to the world. They, there is a diversification going on. 
from developed markets to the global south. But yeah, I mean, uh, I think that, I think that mostly depends on how external demand is doing. What I could say the positive thing for uh, for for exporters in China is that given how prices are going down in the market. When they export to other markets, they do it at, at competitive prices. For instance, we know that the European Union is going to already impose temporary tariffs on NEVs. Now, despite those tariffs, some Chinese brands, actually, they can absorb those tariffs and remain less expensive than their Western counterparts. So they are benefiting from that. So it's a, it's a combination of low prices, manufacturing capacity, and the ability to innovate, I would say. Yeah, and you know, the manufacturing moved to China for the most part because of the low cost of labor. You know, it was a labor arbitrage play offset by the transportation costs to, you know, get it to other markets. But that you've talked about this before, and you've written about the cost of labor in China that that you know has risen, and uh, that that. You know, I guess that benefit is slowly disappearing, but not gone yet. Absolutely. So the thing with supply side, with supply chains, Steve, is that they are dynamic, right? They they are the way by which uh, multinationals from whichever country, they are the way by which they are going to leverage the factor endowments of each economy. Now, those factor endowments change with time as economies develop. So for China, it used to be, or one of them used to be, the uh, you know inexpensive labor that has changed right so for companies that value inexpensive labor they need to now shift to other markets so they're looking at southeast asia for example so now china has risen to become more of a, an economy that offers research and development capacity uh, and uh, innovative uh, industrial ecosystem skilled talent for example now those uh, factor endowments will also vary per sector but What's interesting from, from, from our uh, survey is that when MNCs think about de-risking, over 70% 70, over 70 of them told us that in order to de-risk their China business, they are localizing more of their investments and operations. That in itself tells you that China already, already has an alternative for those very high value added supply chains, right? So China itself already offers that, that alternative. Now, some of them are also telling us that they are like, uh, well, not some of them, around uh, a little bit more than 20% are telling us that they are also looking at other uh, regions in the world to build uh, alternative hubs of production. Um, and over the next two years, 58% uh, of them told us that they are going to, or are planning to shift supply chains to India and a little bit uh, less than 50% told us that they are doing the same and shifting supply chains to Southeast Asia. So it's a combination between localization and uh, diversification. And of course, uh, when I talk with the CEOs, what they, what, what they want to do with all of this is just to increase the resilience of their global operations. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that brings us to sort of the final uh, topic area. And, you know, you, you cannot discuss business in China without thinking about the context of geopolitics. We at the conference board, of course, are totally nonpartisan and don't get into the politics, but the CEOs have to navigate this, this you know, relationship between China and the rest of the world. Talk about what the CEOs told us about China's foreign policy relationships. It is not such a positive uh, result, Steve. Um, there is a considerable degree of pessimism regarding the outlook of Sino-Western relations. 35% of uh, the respondents expect that China-EU relations will worsen over the next three years. And 55% expect that China-US relations will worsen over the next three years. So it's it's... It's quite uh, concerning in my view, but that's th those are the perceptions. In terms of why they think that the friction points, actually for Sino-Western relations, an important one is uh, China's relationship with Russia, for example. Also concerns about industrial overcapacity and about the risking from China. So those are the three key friction points. Now, for the US in particular, actually, 
the South China Sea and cross strait relations is, is, is a top uh, friction point. So the combination of all of these uh, in the CEO's perspective is uh, negative for the outlook of Sino-Western relations. Yeah, and but uh, you know CEOs have to navigate this. I mean, they they may be domiciled in the U.S. or one of these Western European nations that you know that have heightened tensions, but they have to stay neutral and non-political in order to successfully navigate this market, right? So, so they it, you know it's interesting because they have to they have to be you know aware of and cognizant of you know, what's happening in these areas, but they've got to stay away from it in order to successfully compete, right? Absolutely, Steve. And we have been helping them with that uh, by building tools such as the Grace and Geopolitical Risk uh, Monitor Analysis Tool, also by hosting events, for, for instance, on geopolitical uh, reputational risk management. And this in itself tells us that CEOs are considering how to do contingency planning, how to think about scenarios in order to remain objective, to look at how this is changing and to take the appropriate response. Uh, They are preparing. They are uh, obviously not uh, just waiting to see what happens, but they are uh, maintaining uh, an objective view on everything. They are, as you say, uh, they're not taking sides, but it's it's a challenging, it's a challenging time. It's definitely a challenging time. But it's, it's a positive thing that to see in the events that we host at the China Center to see how the CEOs are preparing, how they are aligning with their head offices on what to do, and to see that they're prepared to do you know, what's necessary in order to face this a very disruptive geopolitical environment. Any final, um, any final points that we have not talked about that the CEOs have told us? Yes. Um, so one of the one of the very interesting results of, of the of the measure of CEO confidence survey is uh, and related to this to what I mentioned before that in order to continue winning in China, the competitiveness of goods and services is imperative. Just maintaining that competitiveness is imperative. One of the things that we uh, we saw is that CEOs are telling us that the amount of resources that the company allocates to uh, leveraging Chinese innovations, that is to say innovations developing in this market, is not sufficient, right? And so that tells you also that the local competitors over the past decades have been innovated at a very rapid pace. And that in itself is what makes them extremely, extremely competitive, not only in China, but also in the international market. It's very interesting because last week when I was talking to some CEOs, being in China is not only long, uh, not only about the the demand of the market, is not only about the sophistication of its industrial ecosystem. It's also about preparing for the the next three decades of growth. So if we think about the, the delta of growth over the next three decades, of course, the US, Europe, and China will continue being very important markets. But the delta of growth perhaps is going to be in the global south. The global south is where Chinese companies are very competitive right now. So if you want to prevent these competitors from eating your market share in global south nations, you have to be here in order to understand how they are competing, what are the new innovations, and you know, how to remain competitive in the global economy. So that's that's very important. And in order to do that, the CEOs in China think that incorporating those innovations in China to the benefit of global operations is very important. All right, Alfredo, thanks for being with us today and sharing this uh, these results on the CEO confidence in China. Thank you, Steve. It was great to be with you. You've been listening to C-Suite Perspectives a podcast by the Conference Board.